Hi, and welcome to this very first build episode. Let's take a first step towards building a superscalar out-of-order processor core from scratch. Processors are a digital circuit and they need a clock to run on. And the most basic way to run our CPU is to just use a button to generate the clock panels. This allows us to manually step through individual clock cycles and inspect what's going on. That's great for debugging problems and trying out new hardware and generally getting a feel for what the processor is doing. So let's get going with the very first breadboard of the build. Now these breadboards have two power rails, one at the top and one at the bottom. The first thing we'll always want to do is connect them together so we can power our chips both from the top and the bottom. Since we're going to put down a lot of digital circuits that do their magic when a clock pulse happens, it pays off to add a decoupling capacitor into the power rail. The power cable that we plug into the breadboard takes some time to start and stop the flow of current, which is problematic if our chips all want current at the same time. This capacitor acts as a small energy reservoir that helps provide that initial current when the clock signal causes all the chips in the design to become active at the same time. Let's start out simple by connecting one of these push buttons to ground on one side and through a 100k resistor to VDD on the other side. The button will connect the two terminals on the left to the two terminals on the right when we push it and disconnect them again when we release it. That will pull our output low towards ground when the button is pushed. And the resistor ensures that the output will go high towards VDD when the button is released. Without that resistor, the output would just float without any defined potential and digital chips really don't like that. Let's hook up an LED as well so we can observe the state of our clock line. Remember that pushing the button will pull the output low and releasing it will pull it high. So we have an active low inverted clock signal. We'll want one end of the LED to be connected to VDD through a resistor and the other end to connect to our button. So when we push the button, the LED has a beautiful path from VDD to ground and will light up. Let's push this button and there you go, the LED lights up and as soon as I release the button again, the LED goes off. Great, that looks like it's working. However, there's a problem with the setup that is not evident from the LED, but which we'll see as soon as we use this clock to drive an actual circuit. So let's build a small counter circuit to hook up to this button and see if it works. Let's use a separate breadboard to build up the small test circuit. I'm going to use this 74HC393 chip, which is a simple 4-bit binary counter. Actually, it's two independent counters in one package, but we'll just use one of them for now. So let's place this chip. Connect the power rails of the breadboard alongside some decoupling capacitors. And hook up its power and ground. Pin 1 is the clock input, which we'll be hooking up to our clock generator later. Let's connect that to ground for now. Pin 2 is the reset input, which resets the counter back to zero. This is an active high reset, so let's connect this to ground so the chip actually counts and doesn't inadvertently reset all the time. Pins 3, 4, 5, and 6 are the counter outputs. Let's use one of these nice bar graph LEDs to look at the output. The counter outputs are active high, so we'll want to connect the anode of the LED to the output and the cathode to ground through a resistor. It's pretty cumbersome though to hook every single LED up to ground through a separate resistor. Luckily, there are these resistor arrays available, which are essentially just eight separate resistors with one terminal connected to a common pin. This saves us a lot of work, and we can just hook up that common pin to ground. Let's give this a brief test to ensure we have the LEDs wired up the right way around, since the bar graph LEDs I have here make it a bit hard to see which side is the anode and goes to VDD and which side is the cathode and goes to ground. Great, that seems to work. Now all we have to do is hook up the four outputs to the LEDs and we're all set. With the simple counter assembled, let's bring our clock generator back and hook them up. Connect the counter clock to the button. We need to connect their power and ground. Now let's connect this all to power and see if we can step the counter through its 16 different states. So I've clocked the counter 16 times, but it looks like it skipped some of the numbers. It even overflowed and started back at zero again. 
This is actually a problem with using the button directly as the clock, which wasn't evident from just looking at the LED. Let's hook up an oscilloscope to the clock signal and take a look what's actually going on. As you can see on the oscilloscope, the clock signal doesn't just go from low to high in one nice edge, but it bounces back and forth a bunch of times before it settles. This is a common problem with push buttons. The metal contacts in the button have some springiness to them and will actually bounce when they snap between the off and on state. We need a way to debounce this button such that we only see one proper edge per button tap. In fact, it seems to take around 5 to 10 milliseconds for the button to entirely stop bouncing and properly stabilize. So if we can make the voltage rise up more slowly after the button is released, and then wait until the voltage reaches a highish level before we actually toggle the clock wire, we should be able to mask out these bounces. Conveniently, our button output is pulled high through a 100 kilo ohm resistor. So if we add a capacitor to the output, we should see the voltage rise slowly when we release the button, because it takes time to charge the capacitor through the resistor. That should hide the bounces, but digital chips really don't like signals changing so slowly. They want a fast, snappy edge from one level to the other. That sounds like a perfect job for a comparator, which produces a clear low or high output depending on which of its inputs has a higher voltage. Let's hook our slowly charging capacitor up to one input of a comparator and a fixed voltage to the other, say two thirds of VDD for example. The speed at which the capacitor voltage rises is determined by the size of the resistor, which is 100 kilo ohms in our case, and its capacitance, which we can still choose. Doing the math, charging a capacitor to two thirds of VDD takes roughly 1.1 times the resistance we charge it through times the capacitance it has. If we pick say 470 nanofarads for our capacitor and quickly type 1.1 times 100 kilo ohm times 470 nanofarads into Wolfram Alpha, uh, we get around 50 milliseconds as a result. So from the point the button releases, it will take around 50 milliseconds for the voltage to charge up to two thirds of VDD and for the comparator to make the clock line go back high again. And any bounce happening during that time will discharge the capacitor again, which basically just resets the timer, but nothing will show up on the clock signal. I'm going to use a 555 timer chip for this task, which contains a comparator that is already conveniently hardwired to two thirds of VDD internally. The 555 is sort of a staple of electronics and we'll use it in other parts of the project as well because it is super versatile and it can do a whole bunch of interesting things. Let's add this debouncing circuit to the breadboard. First, we'll need that 470 nanofarad capacitor at the button output that slows down the rising edge of the button. Next, let's add the 555 timer chip right besides the button and connect its power and ground pins. The 555 also has this active flow reset input, which we're not using in this case. So we'll have to connect that to VDD to not accidentally reset the timer. Pins two and six are the inputs to the internal comparators. If the voltage on pin two drops below one third of VDD, the internal SR latch will be set and the output goes high. If the voltage on pin six goes above two thirds of VDD, the latch will be reset and the output goes low. In our case, we want to connect both of these to the capacitor. That will cause the output to go high when we push the button and the cap discharges, and then go back low after the capacitor charges beyond two thirds of VDD once the button is released. Our clock signal is now generated by the chip and no longer by the button. So let's bring that clock over to the output, which is on pin three. Also, let's connect the LED we already have here to that output. Now earlier, we had the button pull the signal to ground when pressed, so it was active low. But now with the 555 timer, the output will be high when the capacitor is discharged, and it will go low as soon as it charges above the threshold again. That's an active high output. So we have to turn the LED around and connect the resistor to ground instead of VDD. All right, let's put the counter circuit through its paces again with this new debounce button that we have here. So let me hook that oscilloscope back up. This time let's use two probes, one to see what's happening at the button and one to record whatever the uh, 555 timer is producing at its output. Let me connect power and reset the counter chip, which starts up in some arbitrary state. And let's go. 
Notice how the counter doesn't update when the button is pressed, but only when it's released, because its clock input is sensitive to the falling edge. Great, no numbers were skipped and we're back to zero. And the oscilloscope nicely shows the effect of the debouncing. As soon as we push the button and the yellow curve goes low, the blue output immediately goes high. When we release the button, the yellow curve doesn't jump back up to VDD immediately, but you see the slow capacitor charge curve. And the blue output is actually waiting for that curve to cross the threshold until it goes back to zero again. And with this, we have finished the first step towards building a superscalar out of order CPU. More specifically, we have built this clock generation module at the top and the counter test circuit right here at the bottom. So what we have here is a single stepping button that we can press to generate a single clock pulse. But we've realized that this produces a lot of bounce that we need to take care of. So we've added this filter capacitor to the button to try and hide some of this bouncing and then added this 555 timer to do the thresholding and convert this now slowly charging capacitor curve to a proper logic signal. And this gives us a debounce clock output over here. We then went ahead and connected it up to our counter test circuit to make sure that when we press the single step button, we actually get the exact number of clock pulses that we want. So next up in this series, I want to look at more clock generation options, more specifically a free running clock that can drive the CPU uh, on its own. And I want to look at options to do proper resetting of the circuit. Thanks a lot for watching. Like and subscribe if you want to see more of this and see you next time.